This message, if by the grace of God you hear properly and you apply it, your life will change. Your life will change. So, uh, so but I want to unpack it. I want to pray before we begin. And let's do that. And everyone who's online, please join us. And uh, so, yeah. Father, we thank you. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, King of my heart, King of my life. Lord of everything seen and unseen. Lord of everything visible, invisible. Lord of everything we know, we don't know, and we don't know that we don't know. Lord of the infinite, the eternal. Lord, I thank you that you are Lord of your church. You're Lord of our hearts. You're Lord of our lives. You're Lord of every season. You truly turn our mourning into dancing. You turn our barrenness into fruitfulness. Our times and our seasons are in your hands not in the hands of any man. It's not dependent on the word or the opinions of people. It's in your hands, Lord. And we pray that in every season of our life that we would continue to grow from strength to strength and from glory to glory. I pray that we would never use any season as an excuse to not draw near to you. I pray that we will continuously pursue you as we sang this morning, as a deer pans for water, so my soul longs after you. Let that be true. Holy Spirit, as we hear this word today, birth in us a new hunger, thirst, passion, fire in our hearts for you, God. We want to know you more. We want to draw near to you. We want to see you more clearly. We want to hear you more clearly. We want to experience your presence, God. And we want to be men and women who carry your presence with us where we go, Lord God. We don't want to wait for the river to flow, but may the rivers flow out of our innermost being, as you said, that those who believe in you would. Let the rivers gush forth of the, of the Holy Spirit wherever we go, for we are your temple, God. We are your true worshipers. We are your true disciples, O oh God. So God, do what only you can do this morning and bless everyone here, every family that's represented here in person and online. Bless the fathers here, especially this morning. And speak through me only for your glory. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. This morning, I want to share with you about ministering to the Lord. You see, when we look back at that story of David to Ziklag, and we, we come to that point where David was at his lowest moment, you see, that was the defining moment. Because if David had got his response wrong to the Lord, he would have not only lost everything that he had lost, but he would have even lost his future. So everything that David had learned was put to the ultimate test in that moment. And we cannot afford to get it wrong. So the question comes is, how can I get it right at that moment when I'm put to the ultimate test? Well, the point is this, that you will not get it wrong if you've been practicing right. If you sweat in training, you won't bleed in war. Never forget that. If you sweat in training, you won't bleed in war. The reason people get it wrong is because they have not been practicing to do it right. You remember my maths teacher, my auntie? I told you so many times about if I hope she never he hears that I preach about her. And I was terrible in maths. I still am with numbers, you know. So I, she would give me a test and, you know, it was embarrassing because there were so many kids in the room and especially with all the girls around, you know, it was terrible because she would slap me in front of all the girls, you know. I was like, terrible. It was abuse. <laughs> 
and uh, uh, you know, she, I would go to a bit fear and trembling. That was the first time I knew what fear and trembling was before I knew the Lord. And she would look at my sheet, and I remember once looking at me and telling me, you know, Shannon, she told me this so philosophically, what a profound statement. She said, there are n number of ways of getting a sum wrong, and you're discovering every one of them. <laughs> because probably that was the fourth or fifth time or sixth time I was coming back. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and, and she said, there's only one way of getting it right. And that's, that seems to evade you, you know. So, yeah, I, I don't know what to do. So anyway, yeah, so, you know, there are n number of ways that we can get it wrong. But there's only one way to get it right. If you practice in every season, when the moment comes, you will know what to do. And scripture records for us these practices. By recording the lives of the men and women who practice right and then got it right at the time of the test. And there's one common characteristic about all of them among another few, but there's one thing, that they were men and women who learned to minister to the Lord. In good seasons, in bad seasons. Whether they were in minority or whether they were in the majority. Whether they were so much in a minority that they were the only one who was ministering to the Lord and probably the entire community or the nation was backslidden or everybody around them was backslidden. That man and that woman purposed in his heart, in her heart, Lord, I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to minister to you because I've tasted, I've seen that the Lord is good. <clears throat> so this message is about ministering to the Lord. You see... It is important to minister to people. It's important to serve people. But our highest and most important calling is first to minister to the Lord. Now, many who claim to believe in the Lord have an attitude that says, Lord, you minister to me. That's how many people come to church on a Sunday morning. You you and I come, or many people come. Let's not talk about you and I. I want to change that. So many people come, millions of people come on a Sunday morning, say, Deo makabe saundi. God, bless me. Heal me. Meet my need. Answer my prayers. God, you touch me. Is that wrong? No. Is that good enough? No. Because things change when you come with an attitude, God, I want to lift you up. I, I want to touch you today. And that's cultivated every day. And so, <clears throat> there are those who have understood and experienced the grace of God and have, from a place, see, everyone starts, everyone starts at the same place that God reaches out to us. That, that we need God. There's no doubt about that. Everyone comes to the cross as a sinner, as a helpless sinner, and saying, God, you save me, you, you heal me, you touch me. And that's the place to start. But the problem is that many people remain only there. After five years in the Lord, after 10 years in the Lord, after having experienced so many breakthroughs, there's still God, you bless me, God. So they walk into a prayer meeting and they're waiting, when will the river flow? Until then, they are like Bhatakti Atma. And suddenly the river starts flowing because somebody said, I'm going to touch the presence of God. And then they say, hey, wow, the river is jumping, now moving, now let me jump in. God can't use you. 
If you're going to wait for the river to flow and then jump in, there's no big deal about it. You've got to be a person through whom God flows in a desert place. And those are the people who've learned to minister to the Lord. Make sense? Ask your neighbor, Ja hai? <laughs> you understanding? The first category of people say, Lord, you minister to me. The second have moved further into their relationship with God and know that God will always minister to them. God will always bless because that is who he is. God will always give good gifts, even if whether I ask or don't ask. What I want to change is that, Lord, I want to minister to you. And that's not an, a, an attitude of arrogance. That's not an attitude of like, Lord, you need me. I am a gift to you. I mean, I am favor to you. No, 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 no. It's an attitude of gratitude. It's an attitude of love. It's, Lord, you give me so much. I want to bless you today. I want to bring pleasure to you today. And we should be this kind of people. We should be people who minister to the Lord. You see, to minister to the Lord means to draw near to God, to worship Him, and to bring Him joy and pleasure. So here I introduce a thought. <clears throat> Can you bring pleasure to God? Are you pleasurable to Him? Some of you are wondering, I'm not sure. I'm a stinky old boy. <laughs> no. See, um, when I see Anaya, I drool. You know, when she wakes up in the morning, her breath is smelling or whatever. <laughs> you know, she's not smelling of jasmine and roses. And it's just, just, shit. But I just love her. And I love to kiss her when she's semi-asleep or asleep because that's the moment of least resistance. <laughs> yeah. So I just, that's why he, the Lord sings over you while you're asleep. <laughs> so I just love her and hug her and kiss her and she's like, Dada, go shave. <laughs> you know, just, you know, she, she brings me pleasure and, and it's a very hard thing to get Anaya to kiss me I mean God help the man who would ever marry her <laughs> I mean, she's, it's a, if I ask her give me a kiss like no and so when she starts kissing me I mean that's a breakthrough <laughs> she, she really kisses me when she like she's full of her tank is full of love and and I see so much. I remember just before she was born, I, I don't remember who told me, but somebody told me, he says, Shannon, you will now understand better the Father's love for you. And that's so true. You, you know something? You bring pleasure to the Lord. You are so pleasurable. You are so sweet. You're his blueberry cheesecake. I mean that. He loves you. He gave his only son so that you could be his. Think about it forever. And that, that causes us to draw near to him and say, Lord, I want to bring you pleasure. I want to bring you joy. Revelation 4.11. Look at what it says. Can you read that with me? In fact, help me to read it because I can't see it from where I am. Here we go. One, two, three. Loud. Amen. What an all-encompassing, 
beautiful verse. It says, worthy are you, Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why is the Lord worthy? Because he created all things. He created everything that we see, cannot see, everything that we know, we don't know. But more than anything, what, what is this most precious creation? Who's his most precious creation? I'm looking at his most precious creation. It's you. And why did he create you? It says he created because of your will they exist and we exist for him. So God created you for his glory so that he receives pleasure from your life. And so God did not only create us so that he could show us his great love, but he also created us so that he could enjoy us and receive love from us. Can you believe that? Can you believe that you can bring pleasure to God, that you can bring a smile on God's face? You know, one of the most revealing scriptures is in Genesis 3.8. And it speaks about how God would walk in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden. Do you love to take walks with your spouse? Do you like to go for walks with your children? Can I tell you something? God would like to take walks with you. The creator of the universe. Who's probably one of your most famous personality? I mean, you know. If you have somebody like that. I, I don't have anybody like that. Or maybe a great Bible teacher. I would like to take a walk with John Piper. My favorite. You know, I would like to go for a walk with John Piper. He is my favorite. Imagine the Lord is saying, I'd like to go for walks with you. I want to talk with you. I want to hear you. And I love when you sing to me. I love when you express your love to me. You know, all that I'm just saying right now is about ministering to the Lord. These are the people who change things. Who change things. Who realize the power of just taking time to love on God. To just worship Him. Wow. So I want to give you some examples. Some good examples and I'll close with that. Next week I'll give you the bad examples. <laughs> because today's Father's Day. <laughs> uh, uh, next day is just Sunday, all right? So we look at the bad examples next week. But here's some good examples of someone, of a group of people who, who minister to the Lord. <clears throat> wow. You know, in the book of Ezekiel chapter 44, 15 to 16, and it speaks about, you know, there is... Bad example and good example in that passage in Ezekiel 44. So Ezekiel 44, 11 to 13 is the Levites overall who were more focused on ministering to people rather than first getting it right with God. See, one of them, I don't know whether I taught this, I can't remember, I don't think I taught this, but one of my concerns for myself and for the church as a whole, is success without purity. I remember, in fact, discussing that with Uncle Ivan some years back, and he said, he said, that's a statement. Success in ministry without purity. How do you firstly define success? Popularity, number of likes on YouTube, how many million views? That's not success. Success is what God approves. Take heed how you build. Gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. And so, you know, we've got to be careful that nothing and no one comes between us and the Lord. The Lord is first. The Lord is supreme. The Lord is central. The Lord is our all in all. Amen? Amen. And our first love, maybe one day I want to talk about us getting back our first love for the Lord. Amen. That's something that's been burning and brewing in my heart. So at the right time, let it come out. But 
you know, many people get it wrong. You, 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 you unfortunately hear of, and I don't, obviously in the fear of God, don't want to take examples over here by name, but you hear of this leader who's fallen in sin or this one's marriage has suddenly gone on the rocks and this ministry crashing and just terrible things that we hear, painful things. Sometimes in the last two and a half years, we've just heard very painful things. And, and you wonder what happened? What happened? It, it didn't happen overnight. You see, if what you do becomes more important than where you ought to be, you're going to get jacked. We ought to first be with the Lord. We're not called to be human doings. We are human beings. We first be with him. When we be with him, Jesus didn't say, work hard in me. He said, abide in me. <laughs> He says, abide in me and I in you, you will bear fruit. And so when we prioritize ministering to the Lord, uh, you know, everything falls in place. You know, Farah would tell me, Shannon, keep your first, second, and third correct. Because if first, second, and third is correct, then four, five, six will fall in line. God, family, health. Don't get it wrong. And so... When you minister to the Lord in, in Ezekiel chapter 44, we see the Levites were in idolatry. Can you believe that? They were in idolatry. Their lives were wrong before God, but they're still ministering to people. I tell you something. If somebody wants to fake it, you can fake it. You can fake it for wrong. But we're not called to fake it. We want to be right with God first, right? And so... Though the Levites as a whole were wrong before God, there was a subgroup. Ah, there was a subgroup, the sons of Zadok, who said, no, 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 we want to get it right. And look at what it says in Ezekiel 44, 15 to 16. It says, but the priests, the Levites, the son of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray from me. So an entire nation is backslidden. But there is one family. There's one family that says no. We want to be right before God. It says they shall come near to me to minister unto me. And they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood. Keep that in mind. Everybody say the fat. What happened to you now? <laughs> Everybody say, the fat, the fat and the blood. So if you're vegetarian this morning, just grace upon you. Okay? Everybody say it again. The fat, the fat. and <laughs> I'm getting a joke that I should not say. Sorry. <laughs> Everybody say, the fat, the fat. And, the blood. and the blood. Yeah. It says... They shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, says the Lord. They shall enter into my sanctuary and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me and they shall keep my charge. See, what happened was when the Israelites went astray from God, the sons of Zadok did something very interesting. They stopped ministering to the people. We're not going to play religion. You better get right with God. And what they did, they focused their ministry to the Lord and the holy place in the tabernacle. The point is this. Maintaining a right relationship with God was more important to the sons of Zadok than serving the people. Did you hear that? Maintaining a right relationship with God is more important than ministering to people. If you're right with God, God will minister through you to everyone around you. So, now what did the Lord say? They shall come near to me and minister to me and what did the two things that they said they would offer? 
Say it louder. What does fat speak of? All the hardcore veg non-vegetarians. The fat speaks about the best. I like what, you know, Auntie Sheila spoke about her father. And what is her testimony today? Even in the little things, you do it as you do it as unto the Lord. God sees everything. God sees everything we do. And whether it's at your workplace, it's at your home, it's, it's when you're with people, you always try. I know we do mistakes. I know we need to be reminded. But let's help one another to give our best to the Lord. And so we give our fat, our best, not our leftovers, our fat to the Lord. What does the blood speak of? It speaks of covenant. And so the sons of Zadok wanted to give their very best to the Lord. So they realized how important their relationship with God was. So when they gave him the fat of their offering, they're saying, God, we want to give you our best. We want to give you what is tasty. We want to give you what is pleasurable. We want to bless you and give you honor. I want to give you another example. And we don't have time to look into those verses. I'll give you two and we'll close. And won't take long. And so I want us to be encouraged to be like the sons of Zadok. You know why? Because see this. I want to say this. I don't want to elaborate on this. And even if you ask me personally, I may not elaborate on this. But I want to tell you something. Don't get carried away by what you see on social media. Most of the times... Popularity and Jesus are not good friends. You understand? You've got to be willing to carry a cross and follow him. Even if you're in the minority. Okay? Now. <clears throat> we got to be like the sons of Zadok. We want to prioritize ministering to God first. And then ministering to people. We never do it the other way around. You know. And I still remember one of uh, the, you know, our guest speakers who came here. I won't name them. Said, you know, was telling one of, our, one of our pastors. He says, you know, he was telling Arun actually. He said, Arun, I still remember one day I was scheduled to go for a meeting. And uh, I was not right with God. It was something that was, a, it was not severe sin. But it was just not right with God. And he said, I didn't sort it out with God. I go for the meeting and God moves powerfully. <laughs> you know, he says, God moved powerfully. He said, after the meeting, I got scared. Because I realized that even if I'm not right with God, God still moved and touched people. He said, that was scary. I want to be right with God. What God does in a meeting does not tell you anything about me. It tells you everything about God, that God is good and compassionate. Don't play the fool with God because God cannot be fooled. Now let's go to good ex another good example. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas have moved into Philippi. It's, it's a beautiful story. I just finished Acts. This is, I think, Paul's second missionary trip. He's up into Europe. He comes into the region of Philippi and a uh, massive move of God. Gospel has been preached. The Jews are actually chasing him. Can you believe the Jews were moving from city to city and opposing him, stirring up the crowd, spreading lies about Paul. And so the Roman soldiers come, catch Paul and Silas, take them into prison. It says they beat them with rods. How? You know how it, you know, you've seen what, it, you know what kind of pain that is when you beat someone with rods? They beat them with rods and threw them in the, in the prison. And uh, what the Bible says in Acts 16 is that what Paul and Silas did is that, and there were other prisoners in that prison, it says they lifted up their voices and they began to praise God. Now I'm talking about ministering to God. You can't do that if you've not been practicing that. You can't do that. If you have not been practicing praising God in good weather, you'll surely not praise him in bad weather. If you've not been praising God in the good times in your life and when certain bad moments, certain bad days, then you won't praise him if you're beaten with rods. 
Look, some days are going to be bad. Could be persecution, could be any form of suffering. Cultivate and train your heart to be worshipful in every situation of life, every season of the soul. And Paul and Silas did that. They did that. You can't just do that in a prison cell where there are probably rats running around you. There's human excreta. You know, they've been beaten. There's no UN over there checking out on human rights abuses. I mean, that's a, that was a horrific place. And right there in that prison, Paul and Silas do something precious. They ministered unto the Lord. It says they lifted up their voices and they praised God. Now, they didn't know an earthquake was going to come. They didn't know that. They were offering pure worship without an agenda. Now, Mr. Shannon, how do you know there was no agenda? Because even after the earthquake came, the chains fell, they did not run. If there was an agenda, God, give me a breakthrough. God, break these chains so that I'll break them. God, set me free from this prison. The chains break and they're still in the prison. And when the, when the chains broke, the earthquake came and, and, and the jailer thought that all of them have escaped. He was going to kill himself because if a Roman soldier and an officer was found neglectful of his duty, he was going to be executed. That was a simple rule. You don't mess with the Romans. He's going to kill himself. Paul and Silas says, hey, 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 hey. please don't harm yourself. We are all here. We just worship God without an agenda. We just minister unto the Lord. And that turned out as an opportunity for the salvation of the Philippine jailer and the entire household. Minister unto the Lord. But my favorite is the last one that I'm going to share with you. I'm talking about examples of those who ministered unto the Lord. It's an attitude. It's an attitude of bringing God pleasure. Of, of, and you have to cultivate that attitude. I'll, we'll talk more about it the next time. But it's about saying, God, I love you. And you do so much for me, Lord. When you gave your son, you gave everything for me. I'm, I'm eternally grateful. I'm this debt of love, Lord, I cannot pay back. And, and I think what I'm just going to share with you is one of the purest human examples of worship, of ministering unto God. Jesus has been crucified. He's been laid in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And... Uh, the disciples have overwhelmed with grief because they saw his bloodied and bruised body on the cross, laid in the tomb. The women who were with him saw him. The disciples saw him laid over there. Joseph of Arimathea was there. Probably Nicodemus was there. The tomb was sealed. Roman soldiers posted there because the Jews feared that somebody would come and steal the body. And everyone's overtaken by grief and they're forgetting that Jesus said that I will suffer, I will die, but I will rise again. They forgot him. Oh, well, with grief. And <clears throat> Sunday morning, Jesus is risen. His body is not there. And, and Mary Magdalene. And I, I just see this as the purest example of worship, you know. See, when Jesus was alive, everybody wanted him. They wanted him for miracles. They wanted him for healing. They wanted him for deliverance. They wanted to hear his teaching. But now here was Jesus' body. Of no use to anyone. Except one. Mary is at the tomb weeping. She hears a voice. She thinks it's the gardener. She says, where have you laid him? I'll take him. Give me his body. That's worship. He cannot do anything for me now, but what he's already done for me is more than enough. No doubt why Jesus chose her to reveal himself first. Mm -hmm. 
I'm happy when Jesus blesses me. I'm very happy. I'm, I'm happy when he turns my morning into dancing, when he fills my cup to the overflow. But there will be times in your life when your cup will be empty. When there will be no f- wheat or oil in the barn, and there will be no grain, there will be no figs on the tree, and your life stands like a barren tree in autumn. You've got no pictures to post on Facebook. But you say, Lord, I want to still love you and still worship you because when you gave your son, you gave me everything I need. And if you're not of use to me now, You're more precious to me than silver. You're more costly to me than gold. You're more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire will ever compare to you. Mary wanted him when no one else wanted him. Paul and Silas worshipped him when they were in pain, thrown in a prison. I want to encourage you. Learn to minister to the Lord. In the secret place, in every place. Seasons come, seasons go. People come, some people go. But the Lord will never leave you, never forsake you. It's a fact, an eternal truth. Amen. Lord, we just love you. When I lost my Farah, I I lost everything. I theoretically or emotionally didn't have a reason to worship. But I still did. Because I recollected and reminded myself of what the Lord had done for me on the cross. He did not owe me an answer. I tell you by the grace of God, not for a moment was I angry with the Lord. Not for a moment did I question him. And I'm so grateful to God that he taught me to minister to him. I still remember picking up my guitar. I still walk in the house and I knew that though I didn't feel it, I knew that I was bringing God pleasure. May we be such. And I believe that when we go to heaven, one day you'll show me and say, Sharon, you did have a reason to worship, but you still did it, son. You still loved me. You still worship me. I'm so proud of you. You are my son in whom I'm well pleased. And I want God to say that about every one of you. Every one of you. Because you will have times in your life when you will not have your own reason to worship. But he has given you more than enough reason when he gave his son to die for you on the cross. Amen. You give and take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. To thee, you alone are my heart, desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart you're my friend and you are my brother even though you are the 
king. I love you. I love you more than any other, so much more than anything. Because you alone are my strength, you're my shield. To you alone, may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart, desire, and I long to worship thee. As a deer, as the deer panted for the water, so my soul longs after thee. You alone are my heart, desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my swing, you alone are my swing, you're my shield, to you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart, you're my desire. Yes, I long to worship. I love you, Lord. And I pray that you will always help me to fight. That you would always be my first love. That I would not let anyone or anything come close to you. Light the fire again in our hearts, Lord. That we would not always just wait for you to keep blessing us, to praise you. Your word says that the people of Israel would praise you only when they were blessed. And then they would soon forget and go astray in their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would Bind my heart, Lord, with God's, with your love and your grace. I pray that for each of us right now in this place, that our hearts that have gone astray would be drawn back, cleansed and sanctified and set on fire for you, Lord Jesus. The fire of our first love for you, God. Because you first loved us and you always love us and you always pursue us and your love is like a raging fire, God. I pray that the avalanche of your love this morning would just fall upon us. Let the burning embers in our heart, the coals in our heart that have grown dim be lit again in Jesus' name.
come Holy Spirit of God. To you our spirit we yield. To you our lives we surrender. And we would worship like Paul and Silas. When we think we are in a prison cell. That we would stand with Mary and weep. When we don't understand the seasons of our life. And say, God, I still will worship. I still will look for you. I still will seek you in the scriptures. I will still pray. I will still praise. I will still lift my hands. I will not give up, Lord. And I pray that Utsa will be like that. Like the sons of Zadok. We will offer our best. We will keep the covenant. You shed your blood, God, and sealed it with your blood, the covenant you've made with us. I pray that we would not cover up or justify unfaithfulness, but I pray that you would teach us to be faithful. thank you for this precious morning as we stand here in your house I thank you for every father every father faithful men imperfect men but faithful men broken men but your men held in the palm of your hand, I pray right now you would stretch your hand and bless every father in this room. And I pray you would bless every man. If there's a father next to you, would you just lay your hand on them? Bless the fathers. Pour out your spirit upon them. Pour your anointing upon them. Pour out your peace, your joy, your strength. Oh, strengthen the hands and the feet of these fathers. Strengthen them, God. As they lead and serve their families, God. Refresh their very soul. Heal their bodies, God. Renew their minds. They have the mind of Christ. You have not given them a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Thank you for these fathers, God. Thank you for their families. Bless their families. Hear and answer their prayers. Oh, their anxious hearts for their children, God. Grant them their heart's desire. Thank you, Lord. You are so good. You are so good. Can we lift up our hands and thank God for our Heavenly Father. Thank Him, our Heavenly Father. Dude, let's do that together. Lift the music up. Lift your voices and just bless the name of the Lord. Thank our Father. He's a good Father. The perfect Father who gave His Son for us who's poured out His Spirit upon us. Our good, good Father. He's a good Father. He's a good God. He's a good Lord. He's a good King. We thank You, Father. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Jesus. Amen.